Last year, I made a 3D map of London using my then new 3D printer, some LiDAR data, and a whole lot of glue. I'm pretty proud of that map. It sits above my desk, reminding me of home. And this year, I want to make one for San Francisco. And I'm going to document the process, showing you how I go from raw data to a final finished product and all the steps in between. It's gonna be in two parts. This first part will cover taking the raw LiDAR data and massaging it and turning it into something you can actually 3D print. And the second part will cover taking that 3D model, printing it and mounting it, and the problems you encounter when trying to align and mount that many tiles at once. Now, my goal here, much like the London map, is to make a map of a sub-area of San Francisco. I'm keeping the same scale as London, so the full peninsula would cover probably a whole wall at the same scale. And so I'm trying to take an interesting portion of San Francisco and just 3D print that. I'm including both the downtown area where I live, which has some good things like skyscrapers and a lot of interesting buildings, up to other areas like the Twin Peaks area in San Francisco. Twin Peaks is about 900 feet above sea level and along with all the other hills in San Francisco makes for a much more interesting and 3D map than London's relatively flat surface. And so for this outing, I wanted to make a few changes and the most obvious one is doubling the tile size. The London map is made up of 48 individual tiles like this. Each one is seven and a half centimeters on a side and it covers an area of one square kilometer. This is the size of one of the new tiles for my San Francisco print. It's now 15 centimeters on a side and thus covers two kilometers by two kilometers for a total area of four square kilometers. Now, these tiles will be a lot easier to mount and finish. Being twice the size in each dimension, there's only gonna be a quarter of the number of them to sand down, align and mount. But of course that comes at a price and the price is printing time. Now, one of these small tiles takes around three to four hours to print maybe in the worst case, five hours. One of these big tiles takes between five and 15 hours to print. Because remember, not only is it much bigger in area, but also San Francisco is much hillier than London. So you've got all this extra plastic here to print as well. The first question is, where do we get the data? We need data that's so accurate that it shows us individual streets and buildings and the heights of every single piece of area on the map. And that's not easy to get. You can't just use a standard street map for that. But thankfully we have LiDAR. LiDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging. And if you think it sounds like radar, you're right, because it also is a very similar kind of technology. Radar, which is radio detection and ranging, is the principle of bouncing radio waves off distant objects to know how far away they are. It's how air traffic control know where your plane is in the sky when you're flying around. And LiDAR is the same principle, but as light has a much shorter wavelength, it's a much more fine-grained tool. What this means is with LiDAR, we can take a plane, outfit it with LiDAR survey equipment and fly it over an area. That equipment will fire laser beams down at the ground and measure how long it takes for them to bounce back up again and thus work out how far below the plane each of those points is. If you do this for every point under the path, you can build up a very accurate picture of the terrain below the plane. And if the plane then does several passes, basically doing one pass, turning and doing a strip right next to where it did, you can cover an entire city or an entire mountain range and get this really accurate 50 centimeter, sometimes even individual centimeter data out of a LiDAR survey. And that's the data we're using. Now, unfortunately, taking a plane, putting lasers on it and flying it over cities is a very expensive prospect and not one that I personally can do, even with a pilot's license. And so what we have to rely on is other people's LiDAR data. And thankfully for us, governments do a lot of this stuff and release the data for free. In the UK, one of the main sources of LiDAR data is the Environment Agency. They have a lot of data for flooding, areas near rivers and floodplains and coastlines, and that's the data I use for my London map. Now in the US, it's a lot more scattered. There's various state and federal agencies all gathering LiDAR for a variety of different purposes. Flooding is one of them. There's some good LiDAR data of New York and the surrounding area from Hurricane Sandy in the aftermath. But there's also other reasons, forestry, geology, and other things like that. Now, all this data is collected on one place called the USGS Earth Explorer. And here you can use an interactive map to pan and zoom around America and query for all sorts of geodata, not just LIDAR, but elevation, forestry cover, and everything else you probably want of all different parts of America. San Francisco in the Bay Area has pretty good coverage from a 2010 coastal survey. But the problem is it's gonna be in raw LIDAR format. And you might ask, what's the problem with that? And the problem with that is that raw LiDAR data is what's called a point cloud. It's individual points those lasers hit as the plane flew over the area. To the human eye, it's relatively obvious. 
you and I can make out the surface and the buildings in a scan like this out of the point cloud. But to a computer, and certainly to a 3D printer, it's meaningless gibberish. There's no surface, there's no solidity. It has no real idea of what to do here. And so our first task is to take this point cloud and turn it into something a little more reasonable, turn it into an elevation map. So here's an example of the point cloud we'll be turning into an elevation map. From afar, it looks pretty reasonable. You can see detail, and it looks pretty solid. But as we zoom in, you can see that these buildings are pretty ghostly. These points are sort of scattered around. There are some on the side of buildings, but mostly they're on the top and bottom surfaces. And so our job is to take this raw point cloud data and turn it into a map of the heights. Imagine you're looking down on top of the data. You want a map of how high each of these points is for the whole tile. The skyscrapers we marked as very high, the streets as very low. We'll then use that elevation map to render out this into a 3D object. We could go directly from this LiDAR data into a 3D model, and that would be pretty good. We wouldn't be throwing away data about underhangs and other things that just a height map will get rid of. But it also requires a lot more programming. And while I could probably do it, I don't want to spend the time to sit down and write a LiDAR to 3D model rendering tool it's a complicated procedure and far more difficult than even I want to deal with. And so the easy option is elevation maps in and out because there are already tools to take data like this and turn it into an elevation map. And one of those tools is in the LAS tool suite called LAS2DEM. So I've got the same tile here loaded into LAS2DEM and it's showing us just sort of the boundaries of that tile. If I was to add more of them, it would show you the boundaries of how they relate. When I did this for real, I of course loaded all of my tiles in at once, but we're just doing one here for demonstration purposes. lans dem has a lot of options. It's a very flexible piece of software, and we can choose exactly what we want to turn this into. In this case, I want elevation, but there are options here for slope, intensity, and other things like that. So we have elevation, we have actual values. We're gonna leave it to have the normal size of its raster. It will end up being 512 columns by rows. That's the number of points we'll have in our DEM and we just hit run. Once we have our files, we can then view them in a GIZ program like QGIZ. Now here I have all of those DEMs from all of the tiles I have from San Francisco rendered into one big GIZ layer. And you can immediately see the sort of data we've got here. Elevation is represented as a color from black being the lowest to white being the highest. Here in the middle of the map, we have Twin Peaks and Sutro Tower being very, very high indeed. And then at the edges of the map, you can see the San Francisco Bay and the ocean. Let's zoom in on the tile we looked at just a second ago. So you can see here how we've taken that data, the 3D data you saw over here in the LAS viewer, and we've turned it into a height map. Those buildings come up as the big white dots here as they're very high, and the streets come through as these low black areas. This is pretty good. We have our data, and it's in a very reasonable format. The next challenge is to take these elevation maps, which are now just simple arrays of numbers, and turn that into something we can 3D print. So now I've got my elevation data, I need to turn it into a 3D model. But not just any 3D model, it needs to be a model that I can actually send to a 3D printer, and that imposes some restrictions on the model. The main one for us is it has to be a single solid object. It can't have mysterious holes, and more importantly, it can't have zero thickness. We can't take the C, which is zero meters high, and say this is the bottom of the model. We have to add a few millimeters of thickness at least, so we get a contiguous tile that we can mount to a surface. Now, we could take the elevation data and simply put it into a program like Blender and trace over it by hand to make something like this. But at the level of detail and size that I'm making, that would be incredibly laborious. And I'm a programmer, so of course I wrote a program to do it. The program takes the elevation data, those set of points that tell you the height of the surface, and makes a 3D surface out of them, taking a polygon and putting one of the corners on each of the different points in a sort of continuous surface of all the points we have in the data. Now, that's not all it does, of course. It has to do a bit more than that. First of all, it solidifies the model. Once it has a surface, it puts walls and a floor on it and makes sure the floor is far enough away from the sea and other things that are zero height to make sure that we have some thickness in the model. Secondly, it simplifies. 
at the scale and resolution that we have the original data in, we could make something probably bigger than me and still have pretty accurate representation of buildings. But the nozzle on the 3D printer limits to what kind of resolution we can actually print the models. And so the size I'm making, 15 by 15 centimeters, there's only so many details I can represent. On top of that, the more detailed the model is, the more file size it takes up, the more polygons it has. And as you get bigger and bigger numbers of polygons, it gets harder and harder to process the model and turn it into something you can send to a 3D printer. For that reason, I take my original data, that is 1,000 by 1,000, and divide it by 4, that is to a 250 by 250 grid. That reduces it down to a very sensible amount of resolution. It's only about 25 megabytes of 3D data. And that's something that my computer and my printer can easily print and handle while still not losing too much of the detail of the city. The third thing it does is smooth. LiDAR data is naturally noisy. It has errors that creep in from reflections and other things like that. And so occasionally you'll see random spikes of several meters high in the data. So the program looks for spikes and tries to smooth them over and try and give what could be a rough or noisy surface into a more smooth and pleasing surface. One that when you look at it as a human, you're like, that's more what it should look like. Now there's one last thing it does, and that's a bit of a cheat. It takes all the height values and multiplies them by one and a half times, stretching the tile up while not changing the x and y axes. This may seem a bit strange, but remember, this isn't meant to be an accurate scale model of London or San Francisco. It's meant to be an art piece, something I can look at and enjoy. And based on my fiddling around with parameters, one and a half times gives you a much better looking result. You recognize buildings more accurately, hills stand out better, and it kind of matches what I remember seeing of London and San Francisco from the air. So as far as I'm concerned, that's what I want to go for. After a few days of writing the software, trying out different parameters, I settled on a set of parameters that gave me pretty good results. Not only did they look good and have a lot of detail, but they're also small and simple enough that I could render and print them easily. The software, if you're interested, is available freely on GitHub. I've uploaded it there so if you are technically inclined, you can read through, download it, use it yourself, or even modify it for whatever you want to do with it. I also included details about how I ran the script, the parameters and command line options I used to run it over my directory of elevation tiles to make my final set of about 20 3D models I'm ready to print. In the next video, I'll look at the process of actually printing these 3D models, how to slice a model, the options you have, and how to actually print a model of this size and detail successfully. I also look at taking the final printed tiles, finishing them, and mounting them so they can be hung on the wall. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next time.